In this video, we're going to take a look at an introduction to chemical equilibrium through graphing. Um, if you've got this assignment on Edmodo, our website, then you should have it printed. Try the assignment yourself, and then you can check your answers with me here, or you could use this as a review if you like. So we're told a chemist was studying the decomposition of methanol, CH3OH, at a high temperature. She placed a mole of the methanol into a 5-liter flask, decomposed for 30 minutes at the high temperature. At 20 minutes, the concentration of methanol had fallen to 0.05 molar, where it remained for the remainder of the experiment. So there's the balanced equation. Methanol decomposes to carbon monoxide and hydrogen gases. So we want to sketch a graph of concentration versus time that accurately reflects the data from the experiment and show the concentration of all three species, how they would change over the entire 30-minute interval. So we'll put concentration on the y-axis, I'll just write C-O-N-C, concentration, and that'll be in molarity. And on my x-axis, I'm going to put time and that will be minutes. We're going to go for 30 minutes, so let's try to start at zero, and I think if we go 5, 10, that should work, so 5, 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes is a nice scale. Now what about the concentration scale? We know that they put initially one mole of methanol into the 5 liter flask, so if we think of a formula C is equal to N over V, the concentration is moles divided by the volume. The initial concentration is one mole divided by five liters is 0 0.20 molarity. So the methanol is going to start at 0 0.20 molarity and it's going to drop from 0 0.20 molarity to 0 0.05 molarity. So we're going to start the concentration scale at zero. The only question is how high should we go? I think what I'm going to do is if we're going to drop by from uh, from 0.2 initially to 0.05 uh, finally, I think I'm going to go up by 0.05s here. So we'll go 0.05, 0 0.1 molarity, 0 0.15, 0 0.2 molarity, 0 0.25, 0 0.3 molarity. That'll be my y-axis scale. Now I'm graphing in pen. If you're doing this by yourself, I'd suggest you do that in uh, pencils in case you make mistakes when you're plotting points. So we know that initially they put the methanol in the container with a concentration of 0.2 molarity. So let's put a dot at 0.2 molarity at time zero. That's where the methanol starts. That was the only thing put in the container. So there was no carbon monoxide, there was no hydrogen in the container initially. So those two are going to start at zero molarity. Remember, we have to graph the concentrations of all three species, the methanol, the CO, and the hydrogen gas, over time. Now what do we know? We know that at 20 minutes, the concentration of methanol had fallen to 0 0.05 where it remained for the remainder of the experiment. So at 20 minutes, the methanol concentration dropped to 0 0.05, where it stayed constant for the remainder of the experiment. So if we sketch this, and again, this would be better done with a pencil, we know that um, the graph is going to look like a falling curve. And when it hits 20 minutes, it plateaus at that point. Okay, it probably could have been a bit of a better curve, but that's not bad. <clears throat> so there's the graph for the methanol. So I'll write CH3OH beside that. Now, what can I do about the other two uh, substances in the equation? How, how can I graph anything about the carbon monoxide, for example, or the hydrogen? The question didn't actually tell us anything about those. Well, we do know that they are products. So the product concentrations would have to increase. Can you pause the video and figure out what do you think the maximum concentration for each of them will be, and when would they reach that concentration? 
Okay, if you take a look here at the methanol curve, it started at 0.2 and it fell to 0.05, which means the methanol lost 0.15 molarity during the reaction. If the methanol lost 0.15 molarity, how much would the CO have gained? Well, the answer is the, on the stoichiometry in the balanced equation. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So if the methanol lost 0.15 molarity, the CO, the carbon monoxide, would have gained 0.15 molarity. And it would have reached that 0.15 molarity at the same time that the methanol reached the 0.05 molarity. Remember that when the concentration becomes constant, this is where equilibrium has been achieved. And if equilibrium was achieved for methanol at 20 minutes, it's going to be achieved for everything at 20 minutes. So the CO curve is going to start at zero, it's going to go up to 0.15 molarity, and it's going to reach that at 20 minutes. And so we can draw a similar curve like that, and at 20 minutes, a plateau. So there's the CO curve. <clears throat> now what about the hydrogen? Well, the hydrogen, if you look up at the balanced equation, has a 2 as a coefficient. So it's going to be a 2 to 1 ratio. So if the CO uh, rose to 0.15 molarity, the hydrogen is going to rise to twice that amount. Right? If this methanol lost 0.15, the hydrogen would gain twice that amount because of the 2 to 1 ratio. So at 20 minutes, it's going to reach 0.3 molarity, the top of the graph there. <clears throat> so the hydrogen is going to rise faster and reach 0.3 molarity where it plateaus. And there's all three graphs. Now when we reached 20 minutes, because the concentrations remained constant, that point of the graph is where equilibrium was reached. At 20 minutes. Okay? All right, so there's a good concentration time graph. Now we want to write the Kc expression. Kc is just the equilibrium constant expression using concentrations. That's what the C stands for. We know that we can also calculate equilibrium expressions using pressures, and then it would be called a Kp expression. In the regular grade 12 chemistry course, we only deal with Kc's, but in the AP course, we also deal with Kp's. So the Kc expression, we've seen this in our notes, and we look up at the balanced equation. And first of all, we notice that everything in the equation is gaseous, so everything is going to be included in the equilibrium expression. You include gases, and you include any aqueous species because their concentrations can change during the reaction. Solid substances and liquid substances have solid, sorry, have constant concentrations, and so we do not include them in equilibrium expressions. Now, in the equilibrium expression, we take the product concentrations, we multiply them, and we raise them each to the power of their coefficients in the equation. So we're going to have CO concentration to the power of 1, times hydrogen concentration to the power of 2. And we're going to divide that by the reactant concentrations. If there were more than one multiplied together, each one raised to the power of its coefficient. So for that balanced equation, pause the video and write the Kc expression if you haven't done so already. So you should have written concentration of CO times concentration of hydrogen squared over concentration of methanol. There's the Kc expression. And again, if this were a Kp expression, we would be using partial pressures of the gases instead of concentrations. Based on the information from the graph, what is Kc for this experiment at the temperature that it was conducted? So we know that when we reached equilibrium, we can see in the graph what the concentrations were for each of the three substances. So now we're just going to take those equilibrium concentrations and put them into the equilibrium expression that we've got there and calculate Kc. So Kc will equal, for CO, that's going to be 0.15 molarity. 
for the hydrogen, it's 0.3 molarity. That has to be squared. And for the methanol, it dropped all the way to 0.05 molarity. So now we can 0.15 times 0.3 squared and divide by 0.05, we get Kc is 0.27. Now a small note about equilibrium constants, unlike rate constants in the kinetics unit, where we always included the units for rate constants, we'll never include units for Kc. So we're always going to leave out the units. At a higher level, we would see that the Kc's actually have no units, but that's hard to explain without talking about some higher level chemistry. So we're going to simply accept that Kc's will never have units included beside them. All right. <clears throat> The next question says, for the same reaction, balanced in different ways, we want to write Kc expressions for these reactions and then calculate their Kc values. So equilibrium constants always refer to a particular balanced equation. A Kc on its own is meaningless unless you show me the balanced equation that it was derived from. Okay? The Kc value is meaningless. Of course, if I see a Kc expression, I can deduce what the balanced equation was because the products would be in the numerator, the reactants would be in the denominator, and the exponents would have been the coefficients. So when we look at this, uh, this reaction, I'm just going to write the original reaction up, up at the top here. The original reaction was methanol decomposes into carbon monoxide and two hydrogens. In this new reaction, we can see that everything in the original equation has been doubled. So what will that do to the equilibrium or the equilibrium constant? Well, the new Kc, let me call it Kc prime, just to say that it's a different Kc from the original one, is going to equal concentration of the products, each one raised to the power of its coefficient, multiplied together like that, over the reactant concentrations raised to the power of its coefficient. Now, if you look at that carefully, you'll notice that it's actually the original Kc expression squared. Okay? This is equal to the original expression, CO times H2 squared over methanol squared. Right? So what we've seen there is a very important point. When we multiplied the original equation by 2, the new Kc expression is the original expression to the power of 2. If we had multiplied everything by 3, then the new, expression, the new Kc expression would have been the original expression to the power of 3. In fact, whatever number you multiply by the original equation, including fractions, the new Kc expression would be the original Kc expression to the power of that multiplier. Okay? So that means the new Kc value, we could either plug the concentrations into here, or we can make a bit of a simpler expression and say 0.27, the old Kc value, squared. So 0.27 squared is 0.073. So notice the value of Kc is going to depend on the way the equation was balanced. And that's why I said you have to always give a balanced equation when stating a Kc value. Now what about in part B? Well, if you compare the equation in part B to the original equation, you'll see it's simply been reversed. Right? So we've reversed the equation. So what happens to Kc? Well, let's call it Kc double prime. Let's say that's different from the Kc prime and the original Kc. The products are now the methanol, right? The products are the things on the right-hand side of the equation. So concentration of methanol over concentration of CO and multiplied by hydrogen squared. Now, if you compare this Kc expression to the original Kc expression, you'll notice that it simply flipped over. And if you think about that for a minute, it makes perfect sense, because when we reversed the equation, 
What used to be the products become the reactants. What used to be reactants become products. So what used to be in the numerator is now in the denominator and vice versa. So we could say this is equal to 1 over the original Kc. So that's going to equal 1 over 0.27. 1 divided by 0.27 is 3.7. Okay, so that's a, another really important point that you'd want to note. Hopefully you wrote down something about the lesson from part A. When you multiply a balanced equation by a number, Kc gets raised to the power of that number. For part B, the lesson would be, if you reverse a balanced equation, the new Kc is the reciprocal of the old Kc. And that has a really important corollary, an important other lesson, related lesson. If the original Kc value were small, 0.27 was reasonably small, then the new Kc value for the reverse reaction would be large and vice versa. If you had a large Kc value in the original reaction, and then you ask, well, what's Kc for the reverse reaction? It's going to be the reciprocal. So if Kc were large originally, the Kc of the reverse reaction would be small. Okay. All right, question number five. Is this an example of homogeneous or heterogeneous equilibrium? Well, the answer to that is based on the original balanced equation. And the original equation had the phases, all of them the same. They were all gases. So if the phases of everything in your equation is the same, whether it's gases or aqueous, then it's going to be a homogeneous equilibrium. So this is a homogeneous equilibrium, all reactants and products were the same phase. In this case, they were gases. They didn't have to all be gases. They could have all been aqueous as well. Um, but they were all the same phase. That makes it homogeneous. If one of them had been solid, then it would have been a heterogeneous equilibrium if they're different phases. All right, and finally, question number six. Roughly sketch a rate versus time. Rate versus time graph showing the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions over the 30-minute interval. All right, so let's put time on the x-axis again. 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes. And this time we're going to put the rate of the reaction. The units are don't really matter, but let's say molarity per minute. Now, we don't have any numbers for the rates, right? We don't know what the rate law was, so we can't say what the actual initial rate was, but we can sort of make up some uh, a rough sketch. So we know that there's going to be a forward reaction rate, and there's going to be a reverse reaction rate. We know that we reached equilibrium at 20 minutes. Now, why is that important? If we reached equilibrium at 20 minutes, we know that the rates of those two reactions are going to become equal. We also know that originally there were no products present, which means the reverse reaction was not happening at the beginning. So the reverse reaction starts at zero in terms of its rate. Right? With no products, you can't have a reverse reaction. The forward reaction rate, we don't know what it was, but it wasn't zero. So it would start off at some higher number. Now over time, the forward rate drops because the reactant concentrations are dropping, while the reverse rate goes up because the product concentrations are increasing. Eventually, those two rates are going to become equal. So let me just show the graphs coming together. Now they become equal. This is important. They become equal at 20 minutes. Right at 20 minutes, this is when equilibrium is reached. And the definition of equilibrium is the point where the forward and reverse rates are equal. So that would be a good rough sketch if we have the forward rate dropping and the reverse rate increasing, and they become equal at 20 minutes. So there's a good introduction to equilibrium done through graphing.